And turn with me in your Bibles, in the time we have left, to John chapter 4. Not Luke chapter 4, as I wrote in the bulletin, but John chapter 4, um, the, the other one, the other chapter 4. John chapter 4, we've been speaking about how there's a fountain of grace, there's a kingdom of purpose, there's a, a battle in the earth, there's a harvest of souls. And today I want to speak to you about the Helper. There is a helper. I will not leave you, Jesus says in John chapter 14, as orphans. We read it actually on Wednesday night in our Bible study on Wednesday night. And I know for, for me that's good news because a lot of my life I felt a little bit like an orphan. I've, I've been pretty alone in the world at times. I don't know if you've ever felt like that, that you're alone and there's not a lot of people in your life. You're not sure who you can really trust on and rely on. Not sure if the God you read about in the Bible is, is actually going sh- to show up for you in a real and tangible way when it really counts in your life. And there's a woman in the Bible who felt a lot like this in the middle of the heat of the day in the town of Sychar. We read about her in John chapter 4, and verse 3. It says, he, Jesus left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. And he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank for himself as did his livestock. You see, it's it's an interesting moment. There's so many things we could observe about this passage. Jesus, a Jewish man, asking a Samaritan woman for for a drink in the middle of the day. There's all kinds of cultural implications for that. It's not ethically inappropriate for a man to ask a woman for a drink in that culture. In fact, it was pretty normal. The women were the ones who went to draw water. They were the ones who had the pots, and they were the ones who they were the custodians of the wells, if you like. Uh, they didn't like men messing with them. And so, so it, it's a very normal thing for you to ask for a drink from the women that would gather in the cool of the day and and and. and pull up the water. In fact, we see it in, in Genesis, the Genesis narrative, when, when Abram's servant Eliezer goes to, to find uh, a wife for Isaac. It's the same experience, a weary traveler by a well asking for a drink of water. It's not that it's culturally inappropriate for a man to ask a woman, but what is culturally inappropriate is for a Jewish man to ask a Samaritan woman that same question to afford her that same kind of dignity of coming in a vulnerable place and saying, I need something. See, Jesus, the Jew, makes himself vulnerable to a woman of Samaria. And she's like, but we don't have any dealings with each other. You, you, you're not allowed to associate with us. Where You consider us to be, to, be, to be inferior than you. It's a very disruptive conversation. And Jesus comes to her in this place of vulnerability, making her aware of his physical need for water. If you've traveled around and you walked uh, those, those roads through, through central Samaria and, and, and you understand the topography and the heat of the day, water is life. You can't go that long without, without having water before you faint, you pass out, you you expire, you know. It's a, uh, the, 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 the asking for water is the most fundamental primary request anyone can ask for someone else in the Middle East. And you're putting your life in their hands. Jesus comes in this place of vulnerability. He comes with open hands. He comes in, in the most unthreatening posture he could ever appear to the woman at the well. As an outsider dependent 
upon her charity, taking the position of a stranger, appealing to the ancient Middle Eastern Bedouin ethic of hospitality. And yet, it's a funny thing. Jesus comes to help the woman at the well. Jesus comes to meet the woman at the well, and he does so by asking her for help. Isn't that so interesting in our lives? How, how Jesus actually often asks us for something in order that we might respond and he can actually open the door to help us. Because she has, she has the physical water, but she is in a parched, dry, broken place. She's drawing water from the well in the middle of the day, which means by definition she is an outcast. She is a stranger. She's not, she's not welcome in the society of women of her town. She has to go in secret. She has to go at a time when no one else is going to. Because drawing water from the well in the cool of the day was the great social event of the community. And the women would gather and they would draw the water together and they'd carry each other's loads and they would share each other's stories. And it was, it meant you were part, you belonged, you had a place in that society. And this woman has no place in that society. She doesn't belong, which is why she's out there on her own in the heat of the day, drawing water in secret. And so she actually is an outcast, and she is a stranger herself. And the stranger comes to her and says, can you give me a drink? It's a really interesting thing what Jesus is doing. He's turning the tables on her whole perception of her life. She's a woman with a checkered past, we learn as we, as we go through the narrative of the rest of the chapter. She's, chapter. she's got lots of regret. She's got lots of questions. And the Lord invites her into relationship with him from this posture of vulnerability and gentleness. He, he actually begins by, by expressing his need. He needs water. And, and it's interesting how the only way we can ever really receive or, or gain help in our lives is when we're prepared to actually admit that we need help. We need something, and, and, and we're so bad at confessing our need of anything. You know, are you in need today, or, or, or have you got it all figured out? Because there's two types of people in the world. There's two particular main groups of people who have everything figured out, men and two-year-olds. <laughs> two-year-olds typically will say, me do it, me do it, me do it. Have you ever been around a two-year-old? Um, and men will do that. Everybody else is quite willing to ask for help or ask for directions or, or those kind of things. But I, I fit into that other category of someone who doesn't like to ask for help. I don't like to ask for directions because why couldn't I figure it out on my own? And, and, and I, 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 I don't like to admit that I'm not doing well or I'm struggling because I'm supposed to have it all together. Do you feel like that sometimes? Hey, listen to how Paul addresses this. In the church in current. It's a, it's a very scathing sentence he gives. He's addressing a church that is filled with all kinds of wonderful expressions of spirituality. I mean, they're speaking in tongues, and they're prophesying, and they're healing, and they're doing miracles, and they're doing all kinds of things, but they're also slipping around and worshiping idols and involved in all kinds of occult stuff. I mean, it's just, I mean, the church in Corinth is just the, the ultimate kind of like crazy church. Have you been in the crazy church? Uh, it, it's, just, it's just one of those things. And, and they're, they're getting a little upset with Paul because he's trying to like rein them in a little bit. And he's trying to actually uh, teach them some basic principles of Christian ethics. And they're pushing back on him. And he pushes back on them. Pushing back on him because he's not a great speaker and he doesn't know anything and all this kind of stuff. And this is how he responds to them. He says, already you have all that you want. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 8. Already you've become rich. Without us, you have become kings, and would that you did reign, so that we might share that rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all men, like men sentenced to death because we've become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We're poorly dressed. Buffeted and homeless, we labor, working with our hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. 
When slandered, we entreat. We have become and still are, still are like the scum of the world and the refuse of all things. Wow. What's Paul saying? Well, you don't need any help because you've got it all figured out. And you're just awesome and kings. People like me, we struggle with stuff. We know that we need help. And what's he doing? He's trying to shine a light on their pride, on their arrogance, and on their self-sufficiency. And it got really quiet in here. Why? Because we're proud, and we're arrogant, and we're self-sufficient. And we think like any any two-year-old. We think, me, do it by myself. I don't need you. I don't need others. And I certainly don't need the Holy Spirit. Because that's how we've kind of grown up in church, isn't it? We've grown up in church with this idea that, that, we, that we, we, we do need just enough help to kind of get over the line and pray a prayer and maybe get baptized. But then we're good and we got this. We're very firmly taking the wheel of our lives. And anybody who tries to tell us that we need to rely or depend on the power of the Holy Spirit is selling something. That's how we think. As Christians, and my challenge to you today is, do you need help? Because there is a helper. And the only reason he is not active and available in your life is you are too proud and arrogant to ask for it. That's what the Bible says. And why do I know it? Because I'm too proud and arrogant to ask for help. Ask Bonnie. (laughs) She'll tell you. She'll tell you the truth. (laughs) <laughs> and so here, here's, this, here's this, this question, this woman, her life is a complete train wreck, complete train wreck. And Jesus shows up and asks her for a drink of water, and she tries to teach him about the Bible. It's really funny. I mean, she tries to engage him in this the- theological debate. And all he really says to her, it's a wonderful, wonderful, gentle, beautiful. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Who are you? You say you've got living water. If you knew who it was who was speaking here, you'd ask him for water. And she's like, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. Because the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. It's very similar to something that Jesus says a few chapters later. We spoke about it a few weeks ago on the last and great day of the Feast of Tabernacles. In John chapter 7, Jesus stands up on the temple, stands up in front of the throngs of people as they're performing this water libation ceremony. And he says, is anybody thirsty? And everybody's thirsty. And then he says this, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said out of his heart, will flow rivers of living water. And now he said this, John says, now he said this about the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so often we focus on Jesus the giver, and rightly so we focus on him. But we forget who Jesus is speaking about. He's speaking about the Holy Spirit a helper who at that moment had not yet been given, but has been promised to everyone who believes. Do you need help? Because there is a helper. And here's the truth. We have to come to that point in our spiritual life where we realize we cannot do it on our own. And the only thing that will stop us is our pride. Our pride and our arrogance and our self-sufficiency Do you believe that there's a deep well that is available to you? It's funny. She said to Jesus, the woman says, the well is deep and you've got nothing to draw water from. And that's kind of how I feel most of us are. There's a deep well of the power and the availability of the, of the, the help and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we've got nothing to draw from that well with. Why? Because we don't want to receive the help of the help. And we've got all kinds of theological ideas why we we don't need it or we shouldn't have it or we don't believe in it. But there is a voice that is available to you gently behind you, as it says in in Isaiah chapter 30, speaking to you that this is the way, walk in it. 
There's a hand that is ready to guide you. We are not called into the Christian life just to have some kind of sanctified common sense. Because there's very little in this Bible that makes sense. We walk around Jericho seven times, blowing horns, and the walls will fall down. I mean, honestly, some of you are from military people. I mean, what kind of military strategy is that? It's not a mil- send out the singers ahead of the <laughs> send out the worship team ahead of the army and see how it goes for you. I mean, you know, the funny thing is about relying on the power of God is often the voice of God will get you to do things that don't make sense. This is the problem I have is I want God to make sense and his ways are higher than my ways and his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. I you see I need help but I don't like the help that he gives me. I want a different kind of help. I want a different kind of help than the Holy Spirit help. And so the the reality is, is that if we want to access this deep well of the Spirit and draw from the water that is available to us, we're going to have to ask for help. And we're going to have to have a relationship with the helper. You know, in John, in Psalm 46, The psalmist says this, God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, a holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her. When morning dawns, do you believe that God is a well-proven, well-trusted help in times of trouble in your life? That when your life is shaking and falling apart, he is, he is able to help you. He's promised not to leave you as an orphan. And that, that, that's meant, I've thought about that a lot in these past few weeks. You know, that my, the, the way I so often in my life have felt like an orphan. Felt like I've had to do it on my own. I don't know how many of you have had that experience in your life, where if anything was going to happen, you had to do it for yourself. You, you, you couldn't rely on other people to give it to you. You couldn't rely on other people to come through for you. And you had to just kind of knuckle down and grit your teeth and fight for everything you had. Have you ever been in that place? That's not how God designed us to be. And so in that that orphan spirit that plagues so many of our lives, we become closed off and self-sufficient, and and we don't let anybody in, and we become isolated in that place. And I remember that that time when I was in my bedroom, I was probably 11 or 12 years old, and I stumbled upon this verse in the psalm, Psalm 27. I remember it, actually, from the New King James Version, because that's what I had. I mean, it's in the 1900s. And... uh, (laughs) And, uh, and, and it said, when my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. So teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Well, you see, there comes a point in all of our lives where everybody around us is going to leave us and forsake us. And that's why we need a helper. That's why we need a helper, and there is help available to us. Do you, do you want him to teach you? Do you want him to guide you? Do you want him to leave you? Or do you think, as I have most of my life, that I'm doing such a good job of it that I, I can do it all by myself? Like the taxi drivers. You know, we had this thing in London in the, in the old days before GPS, I guess. where they, The taxi drivers, black cab drivers in London, they had to take a test. Uh, a test to know the, they had to know every street in the city. And they had to know not just every street. They had to know which time of day to take what street to go where and which alley led to what street and how to, how to get someone from A to B. And the test was called the knowledge. And so in London, you talk to do you have the knowledge? You have the, I've got the knowledge. You know, people have the knowledge or they don't have the knowledge. They either have it or they don't have it. And it's this ultimate kind of like, you didn't need anyone. You didn't need any map. You didn't need, you had it. You, you just had it. And so often we go through life thinking that we've got the knowledge. We've got everything we need to know. And, and the problem is 
So they start changing the streets and putting in one-way systems and all that kind of stuff. And it, our knowledge doesn't help us. Our, our self-sufficiency doesn't ha- help us. And, and, and like, like, like a lot of you, I've spent a lot of my life thinking I can navigate without GPS because Siri doesn't understand me anyway when I try and talk to her. And, and it reminds me of this poem this guy William Henry wrote at the end of the last century, of the previous century. Uh, he was a friend of Rudyard Kipling and Robert Louis Stevenson. And it, there's this very, very memorable, very famous, defiant final stanza of this poem Invictus. And it goes like this. It says, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate, and I am the captain of my soul. Wow. See, there it is. That's the heart of the human condition right there. That's your problem. You don't need anyone and you don't need any help. And I don't care. I don't care about the straight and narrow road. And I don't care about the rap sheet of my sin. That's what he's saying. I'm not going to bow my knee to a God who put me here in the first place. So why would I ask him for help? And so what happens is we're left like two-year-olds saying, I'm doing it by myself. I can do it all by myself. And we end up, you know, the end of our lives shipwrecked and orphaned and and destitute spiritually and and living in, in extreme anxiety and pressure. And it's no wonder that John 14, Jesus begins his great, his great, introduction of the Holy Spirit with these words, let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. You see, we are so troubled and we are so anxious because we're holding on to the steering wheel of our life and we're not going to let go of this grip and we're driving off a cliff and we don't care because I am master of my fate and I'm captain of my soul because I'm too arrogant and proud to ask for help from the help. See, there is a helper, and he's available to you. And I'm tired of Christians dismissing the Holy Spirit as some kind of, like, like, like we shouldn't be talking about the third person of the Trinity. On Monday nights, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, about the infilling of the Holy Spirit, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're doing that in our Monday men's group. You can come tomorrow night. And we can talk about it. Why? And we're, we're doing this book called The God I, I Never Knew. And it's a, it's a wonderful book. It's a simple book. But the premise is there's a third member of the Trinity. We talk about Jesus and we pray to God. But there is a helper. Jesus said, it's better for you that I go away because I'm going to send a helper upon you. I'm going to empower you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to transform you. I'm going to convict you of sin. He says, Jesus keeps on repeating throughout John 14, my peace, my peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. You see, there's, it's not like the world's peace. There's peace in a troubled world. There's, there's water for the thirsty soul. There's, there's belonging and acceptance for the orphan spirit. My peace I leave with you, says in verse 27 of John 14, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And what is the price of that peace? You've got to let go of the wheel of your ship, and you've got to give up the mastery of your faith, and you've actually got to ask for help. You've actually got to ask for help. For help, there is a helper. There's a helper who's available. Jesus says in John 14, He says, this, I'll ask the Father, and He'll give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him, for He dwells with you, and He, is, he will be in you, and I will not leave you orphans. You know, this, this is one, He says later on in verse 25, He says, He says, it's these things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. I'm going to ask the worship team to come as we close. 
You see that the Holy Spirit is available not just to lead you into all truth, not just to bring to remembrance the things that God has spoken over your life and the truths of his scripture that he wants to build into your life, but to convict you of sin, to bring into remembrance those things he's spoken and to give you peace. And I tell you what, we're facing an epidemic of anxiety in this world. And, And I'm not immune from it. None of us are immune from it. We are all facing the trouble and the fear and the anxiousness. It says in in, in, uh, Matthew 24, Jesus speaks about a time when men's hearts will fail them for fear of what's coming upon the earth. And I'd venture to suggest if you've got as much anxiety as I do and in as much as you may have fear and foreboding about what's coming upon the earth or in as much as you may have doubt and believe lies in your mind about what's going on around you, it's, it's, it's proportionate to your inability to ask for help and to receive the help of the helper. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you'd have asked him and he'd have given you living water. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. We come to you right now, Lord, and we are a people in need of your help. Lord, would you forgive us for the arrogance and the pride, Lord, that has taught us that we cannot admit weakness and we cannot ask for help, that has taught us that, that somehow the Holy Spirit is an optional extra for certain types of churches and certain types of Christians, rather than the essential, fundamental power to live the Christian life. Lord Jesus, would you forgive us for the way that we have treated casually the power and the relationship with the Holy Spirit that you have made available to us. Lord, would you forgive us for our self-sufficiency and desire to be masters of our own lives. Lord, would you teach us to submit and to yield in our weakness to be fools for Christ and fall upon the hand of your Spirit. Lord, we need your help. I need your help. I can't do it by myself. I'm not captain of my ship. I'm not master of my faith. I'm not in control of my soul. I need a helper. I can't do this on my own. Holy Spirit, would you fall upon your people and would you humble our hearts that we would ask you to help us? Would you forgive us for the ways that we have spoken out in arrogance against that? And I pray, Lord, that the peace that passes understanding would fall and still the troubled hearts and minds in this room. Lord Jesus, you want to help us. If only we would ask. Lord, rivers of living water, we ask for them to flow upon your people. You know, I'm going to ask you to do something now, something to to put some action behind your prayer. If you need help, come forward. Because there is a helper, and he is available to you. And I'm going to be standing here because I need help because I don't have this figured out. And I need him in my life more than you would ever know or understand. I, I, I haven't figured out how to, how to be close to him like he calls me to. I haven't figured out how to live my life exactly as he wants. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not yet who I will be. I need a helper. I need the help of the Holy Spirit to flow through my life and my soul, and my body, and my mind. If you need that help, come forward. And we're going to pray and receive from the Lord together as we worship.